Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. Nothing has the power to separate us from the great sacrifice that Jesus paid. We are not Pentecostal because of our banner. We are not Pentecostal by denomination, but we are Pentecostal by experience. If you'll turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 26 and verse 18, also it is, it is an honor, and I really mean this, an honor and a blessing to share the pul pulpit with Brother Woodward. He is incredible. I, I put that on Facebook, to, uh, and I said, man, if I'm in Sydney where God is still God. I'm halfway around the world, and, and God is still God half way around the world. And then when I saw y'all worship, I said, praise is still praise. Amen. It doesn't matter if it's in the United States of America or whether it's in Sydney, Australia. Amen. God is still real. Amen. He's still on the throne. Y'all not too excited about that. You need to get excited about some things. Amen. And the fact that God is, God is real and he's still on the throne and the fact that our God reigns. Oh, somebody ought to get happy already. Amen. You need to slap your neighbor high five and says, never forget, our God reigns. Amen. He reigns. He's still king of kings. He's still the Lord of lords. He's still Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the almighty God. One scripture said he is far above every principality and power and throne and dominions and every name that is named, not only in this world. Now, that word world means and not only in this age or in this time or this space or this millennium or this decade or this dimension, but every dimension and every throne and every, everything that you can name, he is far above all of it. As a matter of fact, he's so far above it all that he said, I looked to my left hand and there was no God there. Somebody told me that, that, that there's nothing that God doesn't know. There's a couple of things that God does not know. He don't know of any other God but himself. And he looked around and said, I, even I alone am God, and besides me there is no... Oh, Lord have mercy. Genesis chapter 26 and verse 18. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdsmen of Gihar did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essex, which means to strive, because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of that well the name, the name of it, Sitnav, which means I have been hated. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and for that they strove not. They called the name of that rear Rehoboth. And he said, watch this now, for now the Lord has made room for me, and we shall be fruitful in this land. I want to preach to you on this subject, God is my source. God is my source. Amen. You can be seated. So Abraham is passed off the scene, and now it is Isaac's time. And now he is in a land called Gihar, and he is there surrounded by the Philistines. And as our text opens up, the land, there's a famine in the land. 
and it is a great famine like the days of the famine that were in the days of Abraham. And it was the Lord that appeared unto Isaac, and the first thing God says to him is, you are not to go down to Egypt just because there is a famine and a drought. I suppose God was saying, the last time I dealt with you guys and there was a famine, your daddy went down to Egypt, and he almost messed up every plan that I had because he went down to Egypt to, to get away from the drought, but he started messing around, and the next thing I know, he has an Egyptian honey cup called Hagar. <laughs> and then the next thing I know, he's having children. Uh, nobody told him to do that. He's just doing all kind of crazy stuff. So look at here, Isaac. I don't need you to go and mess up my plans. So I want you to stay right here. But God, there's a drought. The, the spirit's not moving here. He said, if you'll stay here, I'll bless you right here. I want you to know there's always going to be times where it feels like things are going on somewhere else other than where you are. There's always going to be times when it feels like that while wow, they're having real church over there. But if God says you're going to be blessed where you are, it begins to be a very dangerous thing to move when God didn't tell you to move. I'm not getting too many amens, but I'm a trained professional, so I can do this all by myself. But if God says it, his word is true. It doesn't make any difference what the circumstances look like. It doesn't make any difference what the situation looks like. God is greater than your circumstance. And God is greater than your situation. God is greater than your trouble. God is greater than your sickness. God is greater than your poverty. God is greater than anything in your life. And if God says, this is where I'm going to bless you, then bless God. I'm going to stay where God is going to bless me. Amen. He said, if you're sojourn in the land, I will be with you in verse 3, and I will bless you. Uh, and, and he said, and, and I'll bless your seed, and I will give you all the countries, and I will perform the oath. In other words, if you'll just stay right here, in verse 4, he promised to multiply him by like the stars of the heaven. And I can see, Abel, I can see Isaac saying, but you don't understand, there's a drought and a famine in the land. And God, no, he doesn't understand what that means. Because where God is, there is no drought. Where God is, there is no famine. Where God is, there is no economic uh, catastrophe. Y'all not understanding what I'm saying. But you don't understand, Pastor Emery, we're in a, in a decline. We're in a financial despot place where the, there's no money. Where God doesn't understand that. Because he's not in poverty at all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is God when everything is going good. But he is more God when everything is going bad. He's God when I'm on top of the mountain. But he is more God when I'm in the valley. Amen. The children of Israel went to battle one time. And they defeated their enemies. And their enemies said, it is because their God is a God of the mountain. So let us meet them down in the plains. Let us meet them in the valley, and we will destroy them there. Because their God is just the God of the mountain, the high place. But when they met Israel down in the, in the level plain, they came to figure out one thing, that God is God in the mountain, but he's also God in the valley. He's God on the side of the hill. He's God on the top of the hill. You're not going to help me preach just yet, are you? You've got to understand, you, you, we serve the all my. Okay, I, all right, uh, y'all just, you know, we're not, we're not clicking here. Here's the deal. Preaching is not a spectator sport. All right, so uh, how many believe that they're anointed? Well, we're in trouble already. Because I know I'm anointed. Now, I know for some of y'all that you think that's arrogant, but you've been wrong before. If you're not anointed, you better get anointed. 
As a matter of fact, I can, I can prove my point that everything in the tabernacle was anointed. Everything. 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 Even the spoons and the snuffers that they put out the candles were anointed to be used in the house of the Lord. So if you're not being used in the house of the Lord, then you don't need an anointing. But if you want to be used in God's house, you got to have an anointing in your life. Now I'm going to ask the question again. How many have an anointing? All right. It's a lot better. I'm anointed. You can't say amen for yourself. So I, I, see, I'm not quickly to be intimidated. I'm anointed. How about you? Here's the deal about the anointing. When my anointing goes forth and you shout amen, that's your anointing coming back. That anointing combines and creates a bigger anointing. And the anointing destroys. The anointing destroys the yoke. It doesn't break the yoke. You need to learn how to read the Bible. The anointing does not break the yoke. It destroys the yoke. If it just broke the yoke, then it could be put back together. But if the yoke get destroyed, there's nothing you can do about it. There is a yoke destroying anointing in the house, but somebody got to get in the rhythm of it. So in verse 12, it says, so Isaac sowed in the land and received in that same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and he waxed great. Wait a minute, I thought there was a famine. I thought there was a drought. I thought things were really bad. But in the same year of the drought and the same year of the famine, he reaped 100-fold of whatever he had planted. And the laws of the harvest are strict and they are solid. Whatsoever a man soweth, of that shall he also reap. You can't stop it. You don't stop bringing your tithing and your offering to the church because it looks like your money is drying up. It got real quiet then. You say, oh, you're an evangelist. I'll preach on whatever I want to. You don't control me. If you want to be blessed, you got to give. Because when you give, it opens up the windows of heaven. And God starts pressing it down and shaking it together. And then it starts. You don't stop worshiping when times get rough. You keep worshiping in the face of your trouble. You don't stop lifting up your hands. You don't stop opening up your mouth. You don't lose your praise. You don't lose your worship. You keep plowing and you keep digging until something breaks in the spirit world. You said, are you sure I'm positive? Because Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Watch. And I shall maintain my ways before him. We always stop at the first part. Though he slay me yet will I trust him. (laughs) Read the rest. Read the rest of the scripture. And I shall maintain my ways before him. What is he saying? He's saying I was shouting before I got sick and I'm not going to quit just because I got sick. I was shouting when I had a job, and I'm not going to shout. Just I'm not going to quit shouting because I lost my job. Oh, I wish somebody help me preach right now. Amen. I had my health, but I'm not going to stop praising Him until I just fall dead. Somebody ought to open up their mouth and say, "God, as long as I got breath." 
As long as I got hands, I'm going to wave them. As long as I got feet, I can dance. As long as I got breath, I can shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Somebody scream in this house. I can only imagine. You do understand it didn't rain that much in those days in that particular part of the world. Water wasn't easy to come by, but it was a necessity. And it's a hot and dry and arid kind of a climate. And famine and drought was actually pretty common over there. Uh, you only had a few options, rain or cisterns. And that was it. But a cistern was a man-made situation where it captured whatever water that flowed from, you know, the top of mountains if there was snow. But it is dangerous to try to build your life on man-made systems. Because anything that man does will let you down. But God will never ever, ever, never, never, ever, never, ever let you, he'll never, I, I thought I'd have some folk that will testify that God has never let me down. If you don't want to testify, I wish I could get David to come up out of the grave. And you know what David would say? I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. God! We'll never let you down. Cisterns. But the problem with cisterns were they get brackish and the water get dirty. The well became Isaac's only option. And so he began to look for a place to dig a well. And he unearthed, redug a well of Abraham. And they called it Sitnad, which means they strove for it, he and the Philistines. And so he left there and went to another place. And he redubbed that well, and they strove. And at first I thought, you know, Isaac is kind of like, you know, vanilla ice. He's just kind of really vanilla kind of cat, you know. And so me, I'm a fan of Jacob because Jacob was a thug. You know, he was pretty much a player. He sees the chick one time, always busting the lip, pow, just right when he sees her. Straight up player, you know what I'm saying? So this, this Isaac dude, I'm thinking like, man, you, you know, you need to really man up on this, you know. Tell the Philistine, this is my water dog, don't be messing up on them, you know what I'm saying? And so, but no, he, he says, no, I'm not going to stay here. So he moves. And I'm thinking in my mind when I rethought it, he's smarter than I would have been because he says, I don't want a source that is contentious. I don't want to be drinking anything that has been tainted with contention because contention breeds confusion. And where there is confusion, there is every evil working. And so he says, I'll let you have it. And then he strove again and said, I'll let you have that. Until they got to a place where there was nobody striving with him. And they started digging a well. It sounds romantic. I wouldn't want to do it. They didn't have John Deere. Do you all know what John Deere is? Okay, that's a, that's a machine. It's not a real man with the name John Deere. So. <laughs> like a tractor or something, you know, with the, get the dirt up, so. So he has a shovel. Anybody ever tried to dig a well with a shovel? I've never tried that. <clears throat> I don't think I want to try that, because the ground is hard and unyielding. And so I can see him out there with a pick and a shovel, and nothing's coming up but dirt. And he's saying, God, are you sure about this? Because things are not happening. But he had to keep digging. And then one day he, they dug and dug, and the ground began to get moist. Now, he hasn't struck water, but it's better than just dry dirt. So now he feels a little bit empowered to dig a little more, 
until the morning that he dug down and hit mud. We haven't got clear water yet, but we got a little bit more than mist and a little bit more than moist. And he keeps digging until one day he breaks into it and the water starts springing up. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He said, Brother Emory, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you that, that there are going to be times in our life that we go through a spell of dryness where it doesn't feel like God is moving in our life. We're going to go through a, a spell where it feels like the air is standing still. We'll go to places where you lift your hands and you can't even tell if God is living anymore. It's just a dry place. I guess I'm the only one that's been there, but I really don't think so. But I've, I've learned that when I hit a dry place in God, that I've got to dig a well. And so what I do is I go in the prayer room. Oh, it's all right. I go in the prayer room and I start getting my axe and my pick and my shovel. The first time you have that prayer room, you're determined to go and touch God until God does not show up. He's going to see if you're going to come back again. You go back the second day and it's worse than the thir first day. I guess y'all never have never had this happen to you. You need to come to the United States of America. The devils are way bigger over there than they are over here. I've been in the prayer room when I'm praying, and I'm praying my head down, and I look up, and I swear I've been there for five hours, and I've been there for two minutes. Do I have one witness in the house? But I've learned if I just keep at it, if I just come back another day, Lord, I will not be denied. I, I need you to touch me right now. I need something. And, and if I don't feel it in that prayer meeting, I'm coming back the next day. Lord, you don't understand where I am. I need, I need rain. I need, I need something. I'm going to keep pressing at it. I'm going to keep digging until I strike the fountain of, of living, flowing water. Friend, you've got to get determined in your heart. Not to stay in some dry place where you cannot feel God, where God is not moving. You need to say, no, I was not born to be here. I tell you what, we got all kind of rooms. Amen. But it's time we go back to the old prayer room. Amen. It's time we understand prayer is a commodity that we cannot afford to do away with. I got to dig. A oh, come on and help me, somebody. I've got to dig a well. Jesus said, it shall be in you like springing wells of what? Living water. It's easy for the Holy Ghost to get stagnant. Stagnated water breeds disease like discontentment. Stagnant water breeds disappointment. Stagnant water and you don't need to be stagnant in the house of the Lord. You need to be flowing with God. Now, I need you to understand something. God is never, never static. He is always moving. You say, Brother Emory, you haven't been to my church. That place is dead. No, no, no. There's no such thing as dead church. But there is such thing as dead people in churches. God is alive. God cannot die. He, he says, I am him that was living and was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. If your church is dead, no, you're dead in the church. There's no such thing as dead church. It's just people in the church that won't worship, won't pray, won't fast, won't move. You got to make up your mind. You got to make up your mind. I will not settle for a dead church. You said, what am I got to do? If you're the only one shouting, shout. If you're the only one dancing, dance. 
If you're only one running, run. But don't settle for dead church. Don't settle for dead Pentecost. I don't care if you're old, I don't care if you're young, I don't care if you're in between. Don't get settled down and settle for nothing. God promised you revival. Go for it. If we're not careful, we will get content with our environment. There's a danger in becoming too content. You will begin to settle for status quo church. I maintain that God moves every time we get together. Even on midweek services when we think God is dead and we have the funeral there. I'm telling you, God is still alive. And if you'll push on it, push that button, God will show up. As a matter of fact, God has already shown up. He waiting for you to show up. Usually midweek service we sing when the saints come dragging in. Some got them, some, you know what, if you're a young person, and you think your church is dead, the problem is, young person, the church is fine as you. If you think your church is boring, nothing wrong with the church, you're boring. Because you're, you, are, you are succumbing to peer pressure. None of your homies going to shout, so you're like, I'm not shouting. None of your girlfriends want to shout because you're too cute. You spend too many time, too much time with those hair, those uh, hair sticks and twining your hair. And now you just, I, I would shout, but you don't know how long it took me to get. You better shout that mess down. I don't care how many hot sticks you had in your hair, girl. You better get hot in the Holy Ghost. If your shoes are too high to dance in, you better go get some flats. If you can't see, then hold on to take your glasses off, take your teeth out, take your bun off. It's time to help. It's time to dig the well until it springs up to ever. I need some young men to just take off and start running. I need some young ladies that say, excuse me, it's been a, I ain't got no young men. Look at all the young men now. I need some young men. That's an old man. I need some young men that's not ashamed to take off. These are old men. Hold it. Oh, finally, I got a couple of young cats. I don't know about y'all dudes. Y'all done got too cool. You think you got swag. My swag is so big. You ain't even got no swag, dog. You can't spell swag. I wouldn't let no old man outrun me. I wouldn't let no old man outshot me. We're not careful. We'll settle for status quo. Elijah walks into the king's office, opens up a door to the east, takes a bow and an arrow, and matches him hand for hand and bow for bow and stretches the bow back. And he said, behold, the arrow of deliverance of the Lord from the Assyrians, and he shoots it for him. And then he steps back, and the guy goes, (laughs) 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 
And the Bible said, and he stayed. And the prophet said, he, what were you, what? He said, why did you just use three arrows? You have a whole quiver. Now you will smite your enemy three times, but they shall overcome you. You should have shot every arrow you had, and you would have utterly destroyed them. Sometimes in church, when there's nobody that understands what you're going through, you have to tough up and go for broke. Tell your neighbor, says, I'm not satisfied. <laughs> they wanted to take her kids and make them bond slaves. The prophet said, go out and get some, some vessels. And when she thought she had enough, when she was content, She started pouring the oil. It wasn't until she had filled about three quarters of those vessels that she realized, oops, I should have gotten more vessels. It's dangerous to become content. We have got to get hungry for God. Desperate for God. I wish I had a few more people say, so you're not hungry enough. When you get hungry, hungry people will do anything. Hungry people will get violent if they... And the kingdom of God suffered violent, but the hungry will take it by force. preaching about being violently hungry. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, woe unto the inhabitants of the land, for the devil has come down with great wrath, knowing that his time is short. I read that word, and I looked up the word wrath. You know what that meant, really? Great passion. He's ramping up his game. Let me ask you a question. Does the devil have more passion than you? <laughs> He's coming down with passion to destroy you. I'm getting in his face even though his breath stinks. And said, give it your best shot. It's just not going to happen. You don't get this, do you? It's just not going to happen. Because if you allow the enemy to have more passion than you, then he can defeat you at will. But when you make up your mind, Nothing is going to stop me. Doesn't matter how hard it gets. It doesn't matter how many friends I lose. I wish I had some help in this house. My mind is made up. There's no turning back. Does anybody feel like I feel? I don't know about you, but I did not come this far 34 years uh, to turn back and go where I came from. <laughs> Nobody said the road would be easy, but he didn't bring me this far to leave me here. 
I have made up in my mind I am going all the For Isaac, the well became the source of his blessings. Without the well, there is no water for his family. There's no water for cattle. There's no water for oxen. There's no water for camel. They would all die. There's no water for crops, no wheat, no barley, no olives, no fruits, no figs. So the well was a source of his blessing and his children and his children, children, down a thousand generations until Jesus meets a woman in Samaria setting. <laughs> All right, y'all don't get this stuff. You need to understand that we're not looking for a figurative well. We're looking for a well of the Holy Ghost that becomes the source of where our blessings flow. I want you to understand something. If you're short on money, you don't actually need more money. You need more God. We have things mixed up, Pastor. We think God is our resource and, and our job is our source. So we depend on, God, on our job, but we, we only go to God in times, uh, amen, of emergencies. My job was never my source. My job, my God is my source. And my job is the resource by which my God blesses me to have finances. It's going to get rough here in a minute. If you're sick, you don't need a doctor. You need more God. Because your doctor is not your source of healing. I am the... He says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, God may send you to a doctor and go ahead and give the doctor the credit, but you better start giving glory unto the Lord because God is the one that heals your body. Somebody shout amen. As a matter of fact, I've come to the place where I don't want any more blessings. I knew that was going to draw silence from me. You say, no, the pastor didn't drove you around. You fell out of the boot, poo, on the ground. <laughs> Not really. You see, I, I've quit looking for blessings. And now I'm not trying to grab a hold of blessings anymore. I don't want blessings. I want the blessor. <laughs> you, you, you're not going to help me. I don't want healing. <laughs> I want the healer. I don't want to be delivered. I want the deliverer. I don't want anointing. I want the one that will. Uh... You say, what are you saying? I want more of Jesus. If we're not careful, all we want is his stuff. And God is not looking for people that want his stuff. He's looking for people that want him. I wish somebody come on now. I wish somebody come on now. Do you really want his stuff? Or do you really want him? Because he, you, listen, you can have his stuff and never have him. But if you get him, you got everything that comes with him. You got a river that will never run dry. You got blessings that will, oh, come on, somebody. He says, my blessings shall overtake thee. 
We're running after the wrong stuff. We're chasing after the wrong thing. You need to grab a hold of Jesus and say, I will not let you go. I want him and everything that comes with him. Everything we do represents us digging the well and keeping that well clean and keeping it moving, keeping it from becoming stagnated, keeping it from becoming disease, our prayer, our worship, our giving, our faithfulness, our faithfulness to God, our faithfulness to his house. Please do not become like the children of Israel. That when they went to the holy mount, they were supposed to go up and figure out about God and join with him and know who he really was. They said, oh, we're afraid and we'll stay here. Moses, you go up the hill. Moses goes up the hill. Moses consented to several things with Israel that he should never have consented. But he consented. So Moses saw God face to face. And the children of Israel never knew who their God really was. I think the problem with some of us, we don't really know who he is. So they said, Mo, you go up and talk to God. You come down and talk to us, and we will do whatever you say. They lied. (laughs) They never did do what he said. And such is the consequences of a secondhand Revelation. They never knew God from themselves, Bishop. They knew the God that Moses told them about. And a secondhand revelation begets a secondhand relationship. They had a relationship with Moses, but they never had a relationship with God. They knew Moses, but they never knew God. It's not enough for your mother to pray. You got to have a prayer life for yourself. It's not enough that your pastor knows, has a revelation of one God. You, oh God, can I preach? You got to get, hey young people, you got to get in the prayer room and get your own revelation. It ain't what your pastor knows. Uh, it's a good thing for him, but what about you? Do you know who God really is? Uh, or you're going on a secondhand relationship and a secondhand. I don't want a secondhand revelation. I want to know God for myself. Because one of these days, uh, I'm going to be all alone and my pastor won't be there. And my daddy won't be there. And my mama won't be there. Come on and lift your hands. I got to know God for myself. Life will happen. God will test you. The devil will tempt you. Your people will frustrate you. Your kin folks won't like you. Learn to be thankful. Learn to quit complaining. And dig and dig and dig until you have a personal relationship with God. Until you understand the principal factors that determine that the depth of your relationship and the depth of your, uh, of, your um, uh, of knowing who God is is the source by which you live. If your revelation and your relationship has no depth to it, you got to dig down beneath the surface, past the mud, pass down until you strike water that gushes up. No wonder the Bible says, blessed is the man. That walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standing into the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of the scoffle. His delight is in the law of the Lord. The Lord just did meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree. Plant it. <laughs> By what? Stagnant water with frogs, tadpoles, <laughs> slugs. What do you call that stuff? Leeches and slugs and grubs and 
Listen, I thought we ate weird things. Camel, seriously? <laughs> Kangaroo, seriously? Don't you feel like hopping? <laughs> Pastors threatening him to take me to these places, and we're like, oh no. <laughs> I'm still trying to get rid of the pig feet. Watch now, his, his, his delight shall be in the law of the Lord, and the Lord is meditated, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers. Notice the plural setting. That bringeth forth in his season, and his leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The tree of your life that produces the fruit of God cannot grow any deeper than the well you dug. You cannot be anointed beyond your source. Do you understand what I'm telling you? If your roots are shallow, your anointing is shallow. You will never be anointed beyond the root system. And you giving, I'm a blessed Oh, Lord. You can just start blessing the Lord. You can start being, giving him thanks. Blessing his name. In spite of the dry place. In spite of the desert. In spite of where you are. And after a while, if you keep sending up those vapors, God will open up the windows of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. He'll open the windows of heaven. And he'll let it rain. And there you are. You'll be standing in the rain. And all of a sudden, your rainfall will start splashing over on somebody else. And their hands will go up. You see, you've just changed the atmosphere. You've just changed the environment. But you see me, I refuse to live on your splash over. I've got to have my own rain shower. I refuse to live on what you haven't come down in your life. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to tell God, I need you right now. And I'll stay there until the rain begins to fall, until the well begins to break open. And I'll say like Israel, spring up, O oh well. Spring up, O oh well. I want to ask you something. When, I want you to listen quick. I want you to listen very carefully. When was the last time you touched God like the first time you touched God? You, you do remember the first time. Because if you don't remember the first time, maybe you didn't really get it. It's been 34 years and I remember the first time. I want to ask you again. When was the last time you touched him like you did the first time? You remember the first time. The first time when you felt him. You said, oh, that's what I've been looking for all of my life. You first got the Holy Ghost and your face glowed like an angel. There was nobody in the church that you had a problem with. You loved everybody. I think we need to pray through again. You need to pray through till you ain't got no enemies. You need to pray through until love consumes you and you love the church and you love everybody in the church and nobody is your enemy and you... you When was it? When was it? Can you remember? 
Paul says it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by his loving kindness has he saved us with the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he has shed abundantly. There's an abundant renewal, but some of you have allowed your well to run dry and you're living in a desert place. Some of you, it's been such a long time since you have struck that place in God where when you come out, you change. I want you to come up here where I am right now. Come, come, come. come. To the altar right now. Now, if you're going to play games, just stay in your seat. But if you're going to be honest with yourself, you say, you know what? It has been a long time since I touched him. It has been a long time since I, 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 I got beyond the stagnant water and I dug down deeper than the tadpoles and the frogs. It's been a long time since I strike that place where the water was clean and, and it was running and it was pure and it was crystal and it, I could see through it. It was, it was almost translucent, transparent. It was pure water. Remember, he dug a well of living water, which means it was flowing, not stagnant, not puddling. Why don't you raise those hands with me? This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your whole presence living in me. You are my daily bread. You are my daily bread Your very word Spoken to me And now I'm desperate, Lord Is there anybody desperate? I want you to raise your hand. And I, and I, lost without you. I'm lost without you. Oh, oh, I, and I, I'm desperate. I'm desperate for you. Is anybody desperate? Come on, somebody. You need to cry aloud. And I, I'm lost without Somebody need to open your mouth and you need to cry out unto the Lord. You said, Oh, and I, oh, oh, oh I, I'm, I'm desperate for you. Desperate for you. I need some hungry people right now. I need some thirsty people right now. I need some desperate people right now. I need somebody said, I will not be denied. God, I will not be denied. I need a touch right now. I need you to shake me. I need you to break me. I need you to move me. I need you to fill me right now. In the name of Jesus. And oh. It's your night. Don't be denied. I will not be denied. It's my night tonight. And I, and I, I, lost. I'm lost without you. Sing it one more time. And, and I, I, I'm desperate for you.
y'all need to watch me keep going. Just say with me, I'm desperate. I'm desperate for you. I'd be lost without you. Y'all ready? I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. And I'd be lost without you. I'd be lost without you. I'm desperate. I'm desperate for you. Lost without you. I'm lost without you. Say, here I am, Jesus. I've been on the fringe. I've been playing around. But I'm ready to make a fresh dedication. I'm ready to make it go right now. Yo! Oh. 